canopy don't produce nectar at all. So they're not useful for feeding adult butterflies, but they do produce pollen for bees. Caterpillars are the intermediate stage of the butterfly. And so they chew leaves, fruit, wild grasses, and flowers called host plants. So without host plants, you don't have reproduction in your butterflies. So what I'm trying to uh, educate everybody is the host plants for the butterflies and moths that we're talking about. Some caterpillars are limited to one or a few host plants, such as monarchs. They only eat milkweed, although there are plenty of types of milkweed, and others are not so particular. When raising captive in crowded conditions, they sometimes even eat each other. So, now with this view, I'm not going forward. In this view, I'm not able to do that. So I need to have my uh, pictures on this side. All right, so some native plants um, we have, we're gonna be talking about those as they come up, but here's checker mallow. It's got very good access. Um, so adult butterflies must have nectar producing blossoms all summer long, mud and water to stay hydrated, and trees for perching to get out of the shade. So uh, in the middle of the bottom are California tortoiseshell butterflies sipping mud at Lost Lake. And on the right is a serpent fly. So that's not a butterfly at all. So they like open flat flowers that they can land on. So here, this is Western yarrow and this is a native plant. Um, they like uh, zinnias, they can land on them. But they need to have to be the old fashioned simple zinnias with single layers of petals and open nectar ports. So these types of zinnias are no good for bees or butterflies because they're all petals and it'd be hard to access any nectar. Um, camellias are the worst of all. So um, a lot of plants, cultivars, have been so hybridized that they're really useless to uh, all pollinators. Uh, what I found in my backyard is Dianthus, which is Sweet William. And it comes in a lot of different colors. It's self seeds, you can save seeds and share seeds. So this is kind of my universal nectar plant. Um, Latris is uh, native to the um, central United States. It's not native to Oregon, but it's not really a problem plant. So I think that would be good to have in a backyard. Sunflowers come in all different varieties. They're, they have both pollen and nectar. A native checker mallow is good for a lot of different butterflies. So um, talking about host plants, Western tiger swallowtails will go on many, many different flowers. The adults only around for a couple of weeks and they overwinter as a chrysalis. And this chrysalis was found in a, on a bird nest box in, in our little riparian area. Their caterpillars eat leaves as, such as willow and cottonwood. So um, you need to be thinking about other plants other than just flowers. You need to be thinking about the host plant for the caterpillar. So California poppies are beautiful, but they produce pollen and no nectar. And so here's a surfed fly on California poppy. I didn't know until I got into this that willow trees actually come in male and female. So um, some people don't want a lot of willows, so they'll on purpose only buy male plants. So they're providing pollen, but they're not providing nectar. Clarkia amina is a native plant that um, self seeds and some people might even think of it as a problem plant because it, it goes all over the place, but it is very valuable as a nectar producer. The common wood nymph caterpillar feeds on grasses. So you need to not have close crypt flipped lawns. You need to let some wild grasses grow. And while the adult eats rotting fruits, fungi, and a small amount of flower nectar, and the caterpillar overwinters in thatches of grass and fin finishes its life cycle in the spring. So you need a little bit of a wild area in your property if you're going to encourage butterflies like this. Sulfur butterflies are very common and there's a lot of different types of sulfur butterflies and they feed on various vetches, clovers, and lupin. And I caught this butterfly 
uh, along the road at Basket Slough Wildlife Refuge. Oops. So um, we have evening primrose that I brought back from the coast. And so we have Ekamon Sphinx moths. They nectar at night, so they're moths. And the, the caterpillar eats epilobium, grape leaves, tomato leaves, and they pupate in the soil. So sometimes you're digging up the soil and you're finding some sort of grub in the soil. And they're usually sort of a reddish color or not the pupa is a reddish color. And you wonder, what have I got? Well, it's going to be some kind of moth. So you can put it in a jar and uh, just I get screen tops for jars and watch it and see what happens in the springtime. Um, someone gave me a... Uh, terrarium. And so I put one of these little pupa in the terrarium and stuffed it in the soil. And in the springtime, a certain underwing moth popped out. So that was kind of a fun little experiment. So uh, I like to go out when these sphinx moths are around at night and have a flash on my camera and, and see if I can get pictures of them. So this brings me to continuous uh, nighttime lighting effects insects. So they're attracted to lights. And so if they're there and stuck on these lights all the time, then they're not feeding their prey for other animals. They don't reproduce. And places that have continuous lighting will uh, reduce night flying insect populations by 50%. Very simple at your house in your neighborhood to switch to mo motion activated outdoor lighting. So we have, if, this is a silvery blue um, butterfly and its host is lupin. You may have heard about Fender's blue butterfly becoming delisted. So what you do to tell a silvery blue from a Fender's blue is you look at these underwing spots. And um, so you can go online and um, you can net a little butterfly, put it in a jar, catch its underwing spots and tell which of the many different types of blue butterflies you have. So um, Fender's blue must have Kincaid's lupin to survive. So Lorquin's admirals feed on willow and choke cherry and other tree leaves, and they overwinter as a caterpillar. And so um, they finish metamorphosing next year. So be aware when you're trimming bushes, be aware of what you're seeing, you know. Um, these caterpillars and things are not our enemies. Butterfly bush is a great uh, nectar plant, um, but if you don't buy one of the sterile varieties, they will soon invade a riparian area and become an invasive plant. Um, you're not allowed to sell um, butterfly bushes in Oregon anymore unless they are the sterile variety, and they're still only one to 2% sterile. So I bought one at Dancing Oaks Nursery and they grow so fast and they're so tall, you really can't deadhead them. I mean, you'd have to be doing it all the time. So if you want a nectar producing bush like this, it's best to get the sterile variety. Some plants are beautiful and invasive. Foxglove is not native to the United States. And this is a picture I took years ago from Cascade Head. Um, it is quite a nice nectar plant for bees, but you can see butterflies would not have access to something like that. Mm -hmm. Snapdragons are beautiful, um, but they don't have any access to all but the strongest of bees who can walk inside or chew a hole on the outside and get to the nectar that way. And toad flax is sort of a snapdragon, and we found this all over invading eastern Oregon when we were there. One of my favorite plants is Tithonia, a Mexican sunflower, and it's easily grown from seed. Um, and monarchs like it, as well as all kinds of bees. This is one of the monarchs that we tagged a few years ago. Um, woodland skipper caterpillars eat grass. They feed at night and wrap themselves in grass stems by day, and they produce one or two broods a year, overwintering as caterpillars. And they are late summer um, adult and so you know all the other guys are gone and all of a sudden july and august and maybe even in september you've got skippers well for most of us our our um, blossoms are gone so i save zinnia seeds from year to year and i start them at two week intervals later and later and later so i make sure that i have 
blossoms late into um, into the fall. So um, also, if you're planting your or starting your own plants from seed, they're not going to have insecticides on them. So uh, sometimes if you're buying from big box stores or even local nurseries, they'll have systemic insecticides because the nursery can't sell them off eating plant. Pardon my pardon my pun there. So um, one, put up with a little bit of chewing. And two, you, you know that those plants that you grow don't have systemic insecticides. Better yet, plant some kind of aster. Douglas aster is a native plant and it doesn't start blooming until fall. And it just filled with uh, butterflies and bees. So native Douglas aster or some other aster that's high flowering should be part of your fall garden. Cabbage white butterflies are not cabbage white moths, they're cabbage white butterflies and they're non-native. Um, these were purchased perched on a twinberry and mating at the time I got um, them, uh, this photograph, they are can be controlled with BT on your cabbage or whatever they're bothering, but that will uh, also kill all winged insects that are of the butterfly and moth family. So what I do is use uh, mesh bags and I brought some. Yeah. These mesh bags, I'll show the people at home, they come in all different sizes. Uh, my husband has some that fit his cabbage perfectly. I have some that fit uh, the espaliered uh, apples I grow, so I don't worry about coddling moths. I wait till the apples are set and then slip one of these bags over. You don't want a bag that's tight fitting because um, a pest species could oviposit right through the net. You want it to be loose fitting, you know, so there. And truly, I, I got this internet photo. They have some that you could get in. So they come from little to big to big to big to big. Um, this cabbage white butterfly is caught by a crab spider. Can you see the crab spider on the left? Yeah. So crab spiders are ambush spiders. They don't form a web. They go where they think their prey is going to be and then jump out and get them. So um, this is an anise butterfly nectaring on showy milkweed, and its host plant is fennel, anise, and parsley. But uh, as far as the native plant, it would be lomatium. And I have a picture out of order lomatium coming up. Many birds, such as chickadees, nuthatches, and bluebirds, feed their nestlings insects, caterpillars, and grubs, not seed. It takes at least 6,000 caterpillars to raise one batch of chickadees to fledging. Oh, so we really don't want to be spraying for things like this. Tolerate, uh, have appropriate size nest boxes for as many as you can put up. Um, you need to go online and figure out how the diameter of the nest box hole so you can exclude some species like house sparrows and, and invite other species. So do a little research of which of our native birds have nest boxes. And um, the reason we need to put up nest boxes is what? We don't allow snags, we're tidy gardeners. If we left snags, the woodpeckers would make holes, they would make excess holes, they wouldn't use them. And our cavity nesting birds could move in. But no, we're tidy gardeners, we cut out snags. We want our yards to be like this carpet. So we need to be a little messier and we can fluff up nature by providing things that are not there. So this is the lomatium, that's a native plant and that's what the anna swallowtail butterflies like, the coast plant. California tortoise shells, they're beautiful and they come in, in uh, huge numbers sometimes. They have eruptions and then they go down and then they have eruptions. And sometimes going through Sandy and Pass, you'll see thousands of them along the road. And they like to have ceanothus. Well, who wouldn't like ceanothus in their yard? I mean, that's a beautiful plant. It comes as a low ground cover. It comes as a medium-sized plant. And it comes as a huge tree, tree-like bush. Um, so one year, we were going across the pass. And you can see all these butterflies in the mud, mm -hmm. sipping mud. And, the, and the, um, the trucks were hitting them. The road was littered with them. They were everywhere. And it was an eruption of California tortoise shells. So painted ladies are interesting. Uh, they are pretty much generalists. And um, 
there are at least 300 different host plants. Uh, um, these butterflies include occur all over the world except South America, Australia, and Antarctica. And in our area, they migrate um, over several generations from Mexico to Canada and back in one season. And you will have diff um, you will have some years when there's a lot of them, and some years where there's not very many of them at all. But you can see how they like to position themselves on a flower so they can stand easily, find the nectar port easily. So here's another picture and another one on narrow leaf milkweed. And this was our first monarch that came to our yard. And a friend was um, on the deck with me and she said, Stephanie, I think that's a monarch. And I went and got our camera and sure enough. So um, this is uh, um, swamp milkweed. So we have three different types of milkweed in our backyard. We have showy, narrow leaf and swamp. And I brought you some seeds of showy and narrow leaf. Um, the showy blooms first, the narrow leaf blooms second, and the swamp milkweed blooms first, and they senesce in that order. So you're always having something going on um, for the, in the hopes that um, a monarch butterfly will come and take advantage of that and lay eggs because the caterpillars don't want old dried up leaves. They want nice fresh ones. Okay, let's see. We need to get off of this. All right, monarch butterflies um, are native to the United States, Central America, and a little bit of uh, South America. And then all these other places, you can see dates. This is when they appeared. Uh, because they were probably taken by sailing ships or some other way. Um, we even have um, monarchs in Hawaii and they have a genetic mutation there. They'll find there'll be some white ones there just because of inbreeding. So um, monarch butterflies can fly about mi five miles an hour covering four to 5,000 miles in their east coast migration from uh, Michoacan, Mexico up into Canada and back. And this is accomplished by several generations, stopping and laying eggs, growing up, stopping and laying eggs, growing up. But the last generation goes all the way back without ever having been there before. Is that amazing or what? So we need to have milkweed along the route. And a monarch on a good day can fly about 20 miles a day. And so that's about how far towns are. And so your backyard can be a way station for monarchs as they go. And a monarch can lay about 300 eggs in its lifetime. So uh, we have two distinct populations separated by the um, Rocky Mountains. And from now on, I'll just be talking about the West Coast migration, which overwinters in Southern California along the coast. You can also see the little tip of Florida where they have some that don't migrate at all. So, a new generation takes about 30 days and it uh, depends on weather. If it's cold, it takes longer. If it's warm, it's 30 days is about right. Um, our butterflies have been known to make it up into Canada. They definitely make it up to the Columbia River Gorge. Um, I've actually seen some up there myself. And then they spend six months or maybe a little longer down in California, never having been there before. Is that amazing or what? So um, Xerxes Society has been counting uh, butterflies overwintering in Southern California for more than 20 years. You can see the green line is how many butterflies were counted in 1997. You can see the jagged blue line is how many spots were being counted, how many locations. And as the locations are being counted more and more and more, there's fewer and fewer butterflies. Last year, uh, it's, there were in 2020, there were only 2,000 butterflies counted, and we thought maybe there would be no more butterflies. Uh, in 2021, there was a surge, and in 2023, there's over 200,000 being counted. However, we've had those terrible storms, so I'm not sure, you know, how how uh, 200,000 will bear out. 
So by understanding the biology of the monarch and a few propagation techniques for growing milkweed, you can help the monarch recover. Um, there are lookalikes. So this is a viceroy. So do you see the horizontal line on it? And you see there's no horizontal line on this female monarch. So that is a viceroy and they mimic uh, monarchs. So it's a survival technique. Um, milkweed sap contains cardinalids, which are poisonous and taste bad. And so that's a survival thing. So fewer animals will eat their caterpillars and eat their butterflies, but it doesn't stop all of them. So monarch caterpillars eat only milkweed, which is Asclepius. Without milkweed, there would be no monarchs. There's maybe a hundred species of milkweed that will support them. And in our specific location, narrow leaf milkweed, Asclepius fascicularis, and showy milkweed, Asclepius speciosa, are the only milkweeds native to the Willamette Valley. However, Oregon at large has about five species. And you can plant any species you want other than tropical milkweed in your own backyard as long as you don't let it go wild. You know, if we're going to let it, the seeds float through the air and go wild, make sure it's one that's already native. So caterpillars don't eat dried out plants, so keep your host plants fresh. So you can trim out mature leaves, you can plant, you can overplant milkweed and cut some back to the ground halfway through the summer. You can plant some in the shade and some in the sun. If you get it started in a field, you don't really have to water it at all, uh, but it will senesce quite early. If you treat it like, you know, a favored plant, water it, prune it, some in the shade, some, some in the sun, you can have it blooming quite a bit longer and green quite a bit longer. Okay, showy milkweed used to be everywhere, but we have clean farming. We farm from pavement to pavement. We don't have hedgerows. Uh, we have weedless farming. And so farming practices are partly uh, responsible for um, the lack of milkweed and people in backyards need to be aware, you know, that they can and should plant it. It's very difficult to get native plants um, at a nursery for your backyard. So I'm um, going to give a little plug to come up and look at this handout. Um, a nursery in Presswell, Willamette Wildlings, um, will provide you with um, things you need. And they have, they are showing up at different events and they have uh, their seeds available at different nurseries. And so I have this handout up here on the table. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Uh, I, I heard that there's one variety of milkweed that's not invasive. Which, well, the best is swamp milkweed. So, is that invasive, though? Um, what do you mean by invasive? Planted in your, I mean, um, they, their entire crop is everywhere. So, um, the one that doesn't really uh, uh, have rhizomes that go very far is swamp milkweed, wow. and it mm -hmm. is native to most of the United States, but not the West Coast. So as far as invasive, you don't want those seeds floating through the air and going into a wild area, wilderness area, because it could, but it's not going to take over by rhizomes. It's, it would take over by seeds floating through the air, which is much easier to control because you can deadhead it. We have our milkweed growing in stock tanks. And so, um, but it's... So you need a container that's as deep as a garbage can for a lot of them. Yeah, they have very deep roots. Mm -hmm. So this is my favorite milkweed, swamp milkweed. It uh, grows about six feet tall. It does not spread by rhizomes. So this is my, and it's a later blooming one, Asclepius incarnata. And it's the perfect garden milkweed, does not spread, does not get out of hand, it makes fine cut flowers. Avoid touching milkweed sap is irritating if you get it into your eyes and can send you to the hospital with corneal blisters. So um, this is my favorite. You do need to water this one because it's supposed to grow in swamps. 
And many other butterflies, such as the swallowtail, also enjoy nectar. It will be covered with hummingbirds. It will be covered with bees. So narrowleaf milkweed, Asclepius fascicularis, is native to much of the West, including the uh, Willamette Valley. It's shorter. It's about one to two feet tall and blooms later than showy, thereby extending the um, blooming season. And it does spread through rhizomes and seed. Milk, you can start your milkweed from seed, but it'll take you about three years to get blossoms and about two years to get a meaningful plant. You can produce or you can buy starts at native plant sales in the spring and you'll be jumping, you know, jump starting your garden. You, um, if you buy from a, a store, uh, they may be treated with things. So you have to ask, but not everybody knows. So if you have a tag on it protected against yada, 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 yada bugs on that plant, you know it's been treated with insecticides. Mm -hmm. The one we don't want to use is yellow and orange, and that's tropical milkweed. It's not native, um, but it may have such high levels of cardinalids as to be toxic to monarchs. It, in a warm area, unlike ours, like in Southern California, it doesn't die back. And so there are some parasites um, that might live over winter on the plant. So we don't want um, tropical milkweed. So Milkweed seeds uh, need to be cold stratified. I gave you some milkweed seeds today. You can plant them outside right now and let that uh, work, or you can plant them any time of the year and put them in uh, water, like a jar of water for a minimum of two weeks in your fridge and then plant them. Don't plant them deep. And um, if you were going to start them in January, you could have a heating mat underneath your uh, plant pot, you know, because they're not going to come up until it's about 60 or 70 degrees. In fact, people often think that their uh, milkweed is not coming up at all, that it needs warmth to come up. So you may think it died because they die back to the ground, but it's not going to come up till May or even mid to May, late May until the sun hits it. And then it's not going to come up green. It's going to be a magenta leaf and then it's going to turn into a green leaf. So people will give up. If you're starting them for transplant, use uh, like these tree cone containers. You, you don't want a shallow pot. You want as deep a pot as you can get. Um, I don't know what kind of milkweed this is, but I got it <laughs> off the, the internet. And some of these milkweeds really, really have a long taproot. And if you try to dig them up and transplant them, you'll kill the plant. You know, if you're lucky that you can tell what a rhizome is, great. But still, if you're not getting most of the root, you're not going to transplant your milkweed from the soil. So this is a milkweed, showy milkweed growing at Heritage Seedlings Farms where I live close by and I have a key to the gate because we monitor their bluebird boxes. And um, so this is what it would look like if you, you know, just let milkweed grow. But these, these are not watered, so they do great. Once they get started, the, all these seeded plants are not watered. They have some bugs that, um, of their own milkweed bugs, and um, they lay their eggs on milkweed and eat some of the seeds, but it doesn't really make that much difference. Um, it's hard to collect milkweed before it flies away. It's like dandelion fluff. You know, the, the fluff is called coma. So if you harvest it too early when the seeds are not dark brown, the seeds are not finished. And so you won't get anything. So you need to wait till the, it uh, cracks open. And then you hold on to that fluff and you kind of flick it off. And that is the most humane on people way to separate the seed from the fluff. Otherwise, you've got fluff all over your house floating through the air and seeds and up your nose and it's almost impossible. So this is on the upper left, this is when you've waited too long uh, because it's meant to fly through the air for a long ways and seed out somewhere else. Okay. Uh, I don't know why I've got that. Hmm. All right, this showy milkweed was planted from a plug a year ago. It would take two years to get its leaves and three years to produce runners. So to feed adult migrating butterflies, you need to feed them on their way north and you feed them on their way south. You need flowering plants in addition to milkweed. 
So five reasons you might consider growing your own plants. Uh, it's cheaper. You can grow seeds to share, which I brought you some. You can have succession planting so that you can have flowers late in the season. You can plant things as a cover crop. Uh, uh, you have a wider variety to choose from. You can order from seed catalogs or share. You can cover a larger area. You can fill in spaces between bushes and trees instead of using bark mulch. And you can avoid buying plants that have been treated with uh, insecticides. So why should, this is Waithia mule's ear. It's my favorite plant. Oh, I just love it. Think of five reasons to use started plants instead of seeds. Hmm, this is not good. I don't know why that some of my pictures have disappeared. Well, um, okay, yeah. So, oh, I know it's just adding new ones. And I don't know why it's adding new ones. Oh, I've hit a button that I didn't intend to. All right, so uh, buying plants or plugs instead of seeds, less work initially, blossom sooner. Uh, faster to maturity, sometimes easier to weed, sometimes a higher survival rate. All right, so you don't want to get milkweed sap in your mouth or in your eyes, and that's important if you have children around or if you're cutting it for um, bringing flowers inside. Um, if you got it in your eyes, just even wiping like that, you would need to go to the doctor right away because you would have a blistered cornea just like that. So you have to be really careful. Here is a uh, monarch chrysalis there, and I ripped a leaf off so I could show you the milkweed set. Okay, so this is um, the milkweed at Heritage Seedlings. Boy. So at least in my count, at least 14 different pollinators use milkweed as a source of nectar and pollen. Um, so this is a tachinid fly in the upper right, and they actually lay eggs on milkweed. On, they lay eggs on um, caterpillars, and the legs can invade the caterpillar and eat it from the inside out. So is that gross or what? Okay, and uh, bananas, bananas hummingbirds like showing milkweed, and Bombus griseocolis, the brown belted bumblebee. Like this is on uh, narrow leaf milkweed. So, milkweed doesn't have ordinary pollen, it's got pollinia. And so, uh, by mistake, an insect will slip its leg down into this hole where the pollinia are, it sticks, and then some little uh, insects are stuck there, they can't get out. I've asked, actually rescued uh, honeybees from milkweed flowers. And I've rescued cabbage butterflies from milkweed flowers. And so then it has to fly to the next milkweed and stick its leg in the right place to get rid of that pollinia. So it's going to be a large insect that's going to do the pollinating of a milkweed plant. All right, monarchs taste with their feet. So um, they only stand on four feet and then these Front ones are small. They don't even stand on them and they use them for tasting. All right, so male monarch has uh, androconia. You can see these black dots and those uh, secrete pheromones. And they also have thin uh, lines. So you can tell the wing bars are thin. So now you know how to tell a male one from a female one. Yeah, the black lines are thick in the female and they're thin in the male. And these endoconia secrete pheromones. So you can tell on the wing, black or a male monarch from a female. So um, they aggressively chase females and they get stuck together for a long time. I've seen them fly across the heritage seedlings farms, milkweed, two, but the females trying to fly and the males just hung on there. So 
uh, I was lucky enough to see a uh, female laying eggs. So she's looking for young plants. She's not gonna lay her eggs on her old dried up milkweed plants. And she's gonna disperse them around so that one caterpillar gets enough to eat. And she's got 300 eggs to get rid of. So you need to have, you need to start with six plants and then you need to maintain quite a few plants if you're going to entertain this monarch that wants to lay 300 eggs in or around your backyard. Okay. All right. So um, you can see in the lower right what a monarch egg looks like. It's tiny. It's got kind of an accordion shape to it. Um, piercing mouth parted insects will chew holes in milkweed and it will leak its sap. And so sometimes you're just seeing leaks. So you have to get really close and look. Um, there's another a female monarch laying eggs and there's a, about a fifth instar caterpillar there. Okay, and that's that caterpillar is done. It's been it's molted at least five times. It's so big, and there's a male monarch. Now you know why. And that's a female. And there's an egg. And it depends on the weather, but going from egg to five molts for a caterpillar to chrysalis to adult is thirty to forty five days. Okay, so you can kind of see the little accordion shape to that egg. And the first instar eats the egg case and then begins to eat the leaf around it. And then they get, that's my husband's finger to show you how little they are when they start. It's on narrow leaf milkweed. And then they get bigger. And then they get huge. They're just enormous. And they eat all parts of it. They eat the, the flower, the petals the leaves. So, and this is why you need lots of milkweed plants because when they get going, they really get going. And so that field of milkweed that somebody was complaining about is just perfect. Um, okay. Um, the the uh, real legs are on the left bottom and then the right top, those are pro legs. Those are just like little suction cups. So you can see the real legs and the pro legs. And so they eat the flowers as well as the leaves. So they have so many enemies and diseases, only about one to 3% of the monarch caterpillars make it to butterflies. So wasps will eat them and take them back to their nests. The taconid flies will, um, lay eggs on them and they're be eaten from the inside out. Some birds uh, like, um, I'm forgetting my bird names. There's a couple of birds, grosbeaks will eat them, praying mantis, wasps. And then they have viral infections and um, OE infections. So um, that makes it sometimes difficult to raise them in captivity because if you're crowding anything, they're all gonna get sick. So before you decide to raise anything inside, you need to know what you're doing and not have crowding and not have unsanitary circumstances or you'll make things worse. So OE is their um, main uh, parasite that we look for. And I'm not sure, I've never heard anybody say it, Ophorocystis electroscara. You know, I've never actually heard somebody say that. Everyone says <laughs> OE, but it's something on uh, the stages on the scales of the um, butterfly. And if they don't have very many of them, they live, they keep going on and on. But if they have a lot of them, their caterpillars cannot emerge from the chrysalis very well. So wasps eat them. Um, this is a wasp on one of my sunflowers. Uh, praying mantises eat them. And the tachinid flies, which we've talked about a couple of times, are their enemies. So I did bring one in and uh, not knowing the life cycle and it wasn't ready to go by the time we had a family reunion on the coast and we took it all the way to Bandon. And then I thought, 
oh my word what if it turns into a butterfly down here and but no it made it all the way back and after that i got smarter i got a lot smarter so that was i guess that was 2015 they went to bandon and back and we uh they were all over the camping trailer because i didn't have them in a cage i mean in reality they're up and down and around so you have to think about these things so uh the year that we had quite a few uh i got fine mesh laundry happers and we put them over individual um milkweed plants and uh that's our backyard so we had milkweed in garbage cans and milkweed in stock tanks and we had as we found some of the plants were free and some of them were underneath the netting and as we had um, caterpillars then we would lift up that and put the caterpillar in and not have very many under each um, laundry hamper and um, so that's and then when they formed a chrysalis we took them inside the screen tent and clipped the whole plant and hung them from a clothesline and then they emerged inside this greenhouse tent and then we could catch them and tag them so when a caterpillar is ready to form a chrysalis or a cupid it makes a silk pad to hang on and you can see their mouths going back and forth back and forth back and forth um, making a silk pad and then they turn themselves upside down and their cream master is like a little claw like things and they hang from the silk pad so this is an internet picture this one was my picture and you can see how they would hang there and so then the caterpillar sheds its skin and so this happened in my kitchen and it, a chrysalis is formed. And nobody knows that I've no, been able to find out why the chrysalis has these beautiful gold dots. Mm -hmm. And so this is my monarch chrysalis from Etsy. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you can tell male from female chrysalids um, by looking at the little slits there. And if you're a scientist, you actually know where everything is inside of these chrysalis. Mm -hmm. and you know where the head is and the wings are and the abdomen so the chrysalids are um, green until they're ready to emerge and then uh, all of a sudden it becomes see-through and you can actually see the uh, monarch inside and so uh, i brought this inside and videoed it emerging uh, from its chrysalis in my kitchen and um they don't they're not ready to fly in fact they're kind of funny shape their wings are all crinkled and soft and they have all this fluid in their abdomen and they have to kind of poop out the meconium just like a baby and then they have to pump their wings and get fluid in their wings and so they're very vulnerable during that time and so in our um, little backyard raising that happened in the greenhouse tent and I'll tell you, every time we opened that screen house, the wasps were just trying to get in. They, they were hanging on the screen. They were looking. So I had my dirt devil dust vacuum. I was vacuuming out spiders and vacuuming out um, wasps. I had no idea that there was this little community out there that really knew what was going on. So anyway, this is one um, that I was able to get a picture of. Sometimes I'm having trouble getting to go from the next. It goes along great, and then it doesn't want to do it anymore. I don't have this trouble at home, I can tell you that. There we go. So um, at this stage, the butterflies are easy to catch. They're not, um, they're not wary. Um, you catch them between your fingers. Mm -hmm. And um, if it's a nasty day, you don't need to let, if you have a nice place to keep them, you don't need to let them go, you can feed them. Um, so by planting milkweed flowers and raising and tagging butterflies, you can contribute to citizen science and help the monarch populations recover. If you do um, decide to do that, I can put you in touch with who has the tags. It's Dr. David James of Washington State University. Uh, the tag is not 
oriented correctly because I was nervous. You want them when they're hanging in Southern California that the person who's at, on the ground can actually read the tags. So you don't want them upside down, sideways, you know, but I was nervous. So, um, and this is how you restrain a butterfly. And I was so proud of it. It's upside down, it's in the wrong place. It's supposed to be, if you imagine this thing in this, it's supposed to be up here telling you so that when the butterfly sees it's coming on the ground to make sure you're able to read it. But despite that, one of our butterflies was found six times. So um, this says it was found four times, but um, actually it continued to be found in different locations. And so Dr. David James has a Facebook page, um, Monarch Butterflies in the Pacific Northwest. And you can actually go and, and find out what's happening. You could find out what's happening with the butterflies right now down there. Um, it would be really cool if you got a field trip to the Elkton Butterfly Pavilion in Elkton, Oregon. They uh, capture butterflies and raise them in an enclosure like this and you can walk through and you should call ahead to make sure they have them. But it's a fantastic um, field trip to go to Elkton Butterfly Pavilion in Elkton, Oregon. Okay. Oh, this is so disappointing that it's jumping around. All right. Yeah, there they go. This is Linda Boyer, who grows um, milkweed, grows native plants at Heritage Seedlings. Uh, without her, she went and salvaged native milkweed seeds from the wild and grows them commercially. She doesn't get any of her seeds unless she's actually salvaged it from the Willamette Valley. Anything you get uh, from them has been sourced from the Willamette Valley. And that way she can say it's truly a native plant. They, it, they are a wholesale only uh, nursery. So I put together a big order in the fall and um, lots of people can pull their order and we make the minimum order that way. And I did that this year. If you went to Heritage Seedlings, uh, website and found something you wanted, she would add it on to my order. Um, I appreciate my husband, Ray Temple, who shares my enthusiasm for all things nature. And thanks for coming. So, I brought a book here if you want to see the life stages of the butterflies we talked about. I have them marked. So if you want to know what an egg and a caterpillar and a chrysalis or a pupa looks like. And um, I brought a book, Bicycling with Butterflies, about a woman who, um, 2015, Sarah Dykart, bicycled from Michoacan, Mexico, up to Canada and back down again. And that's what your raffle is today. So, and then there's free things I brought. You can have seeds and, and those are not raffle. You just take what you like. So are there any questions? If we're gonna have questions from the audience, it probably would be a good idea for you to come up so that people at home can hear the question. I can repeat it. Oh, that's okay, too, that's great. Confusing. Thank yeah. you. Any, any questions? Yes. I got a feral butterfly bush uh -huh. white. Mm -hmm. Never had a butterfly. Hmm. So I recommend don't get a white. She got a, a sterile butterfly bush uh, in color white and, and it didn't attract any butterflies. Did it uh, attract bees or anything? Pretty much nothing. Pretty much nothing. Oh. Well, I've got the pale purplish blue one and it is covered. So I don't know about the white ones. That's new to me. So she doesn't recommend white butterfly bushes. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, is it worth having a very small patch of milkweed? If you have enough of them, and if you can talk your neighbors into doing it, and sure. And even if you don't get monarchs, which you may not, you'll, you'll attract so many different pollinators. Our monarchs show up in June, and uh, they may be here June and July, and then some of them that were up in Canada may be coming back through in September. So I would say yes, but talk your neighbors into getting it too, you know, and talk your city into doing it, and yeah. Yes. 
Pardon? Did deer eat milkweed? <laughs> um, she asked if deer e ate milkweed. And the first question is, should she plant milkweed if she could only plant a couple of plants? And that's why I said, talk your neighbors into it. Um, one of my friends said, yes, deer ate, ate her milkweed. But once it's established, they're not going to kill it. They're just going to prune it. And truly, in my opinion, that's what deer do. They are nice pruners, but they're not really killers. So, all right. Any other questions? Well, you know whose side I'm on. You can tell. <laughs> I don't kill gophers, and that's why our milkweed is in stock tanks. And that's why our garden is in stock tanks, because we do not kill gophers. So, anything else? Any other? Yes. How many stock tanks do you have? And, you know, once they start coming, have they been consistent? Yeah. Um, we have three stock tanks filled with milkweed. And then I had a lot of garbage cans and we didn't. And that's where I put those net containers over. And then uh, we didn't have monarchs for a few years and they needed to get some starts out at Ankeny Wildlife Refuge. So I gave away all my nice deep rooted ones in garbage cans so that they could get some started. It is very difficult to propagate milkweed. Um, I gave you each a quarter teaspoon of seeds, which is probably about 60 seeds, and you'll be lucky if 10 of them grow um, because of the cold stratification, because they may not be viable, because, because, because. So um, at any rate, yeah. Yes. Comment for the, you have the plant cell, you have both particular Part with uh, the heritage for the mm -hmm. yeah. So what the what the um, message is is that you will be having uh, milkweed seeds and plants at your uh, plant, sale? plant sale. Yeah. So you are not without milkweed. Let's see. Do we have any questions from the audience? No, oh, the chat is full. Yeah, they've been chatting right along during the presentation. <laughs> Do you want, let's see, how to, can we look at that? I think it's fine. Yeah, look on it. Look on it. They all went away. That's because there's a lot of, Janet, the, your head is in front of us. Yeah, that is. You poke holes. Can you see the question? A lot of your garbage. Do you poke holes in the bottom? Yes, yeah, you poke holes, you want plenty of drainage. Drill holes. You mentioned the survival rate is very low from caterpillar to butterfly. Has it always been like that or has it decreased recently for a specific reason? I think it uh, in crowding situations, you'll have few survive. Um, and so that's mostly raising them in a crowded situation or um, if they only find one backyard. But I think it's natural for wild ones to have one to 3% survival. We had 100% survival. We put 50 chrysalids in that greenhouse tent and we got 50 healthy butterflies. But we had artificial situation where they were spread out, you know, you know that we didn't have predators, we didn't have diseases. So you can do that. You know, as a veterinarian, your first thing is do no harm. So learn, do it right, do no harm. Don't even get started if you're not going to do it correctly. Yeah. Rather just let them out in the field. In fact, there are a lot of people who would say you shouldn't raise them captively unless you're going to do it for educational purposes. Well, I was going to do it so those darn butterflies lived, and you know, but I was going to do it right, and so I felt as though I did. And I really haven't seen any reports of anybody else doing it that way. People keep them in little containers, they stack up plastic containers, they have them crowded. Um, so I felt our butterflies had a lot of room to breathe and get away from each other. I got nearly 100% germination on my milkweed, milkweed seeds when I cold stratified, someone just said. So that she had 100% germination on her milkweed seeds when she cold stratified. 
one, she did it well. She, there, her circumstances are well. She had the correct uh, stratification. She had the correct temperature. She didn't plant them too deep. There was sunlight hitting the seeds and they were pollinated well. As plants get older, they're not pollinating well. There may not be enough pollinators. They may have dead seeds. So um, that's a highly unusual situation. So good job. Someone asked a question about those that are remote, whether they can access seed. And my thought is that if we have packets of seed left over that you brought, we could leave it in the uh, extension office down the hall and people could stop in and pick them up. So if you're in the Corvallis area and you want seeds, I brought a lot and um, Janet said they're gonna be in the extension office and you can pick them up. If you know me in Salem, you know how to get a hold of me if you're, cause I gave this link to all my friends. So if you're my personal friend, I'll supply you with milk. <laughs> in fact, it's like uh, squash, you know, zucchini is on, your... <laughs> so, on your porch and you didn't know where they came from. There doesn't seem to be any more questions. All right. Well, you've been a great audience. This has been very interesting. Good. All right. Well, thanks. Oh, another chat. Okay. Hey, oops, hang on. I'll get it back up there. It's coming. Have you had the experience of visiting the Monarch Grove Butterfly Sanctuary in Monterey, California? Yeah. I have not. I have friends who tell me about it. I have a friend who lives down there and tells me about it. But, you know, I don't like traveling anymore. But, you know, I'm pretty much a home buddy. But... <laughs> Oh, there, there's there there's specific but there's many of them there's you know dozens of them down there. yeah yeah all right so um we need to take care of the the raffles uh for the two gifts that uh lynn brought tonight and then the book that Stephanie it has brought for someone to Are you going to receive. say goodnight to your people online? Or shall I say goodnight to them? <laughs> well, that's a good question. <laughs> Why don't we <laughs> say goodnight? Hopefully you can hear me. Um, for we that brave the cold temperatures tonight, uh, we get to participate in in um, the gifts. And um, other than that, I, you people that are online, thank you very much for your kind attention. We had um, it was 43. Oh, it was 54 people online, which is a very large number. And I think I just counted 24 here. I spammed all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to end the Zoom meeting for now. And thank you very much. And He's staying um, alert to information about the Tellamy presentation that we will be having next month. Good night, everybody. Yeah.